I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable put on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. To God. You may be seated. Thank you, Catherine. What's up, church? He is risen. Okay, that was not bad. I feel like about like 10% of the church had that. I hesitated even to do it because I, I, we just don't want to ostracize a few. If you're not around the church, you're not used to this whole thing. But this, this greeting, he is risen, he is risen indeed, uh, is a classic Christian greeting uh, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It comes from Luke 24. If, if, like, if Christians have like a secret password of any kind, like if there was like a Christian nightclub somewhere, it'd be terrible. You shouldn't, you shouldn't go to it. It'd be probably really boring and everyone praying for each other. That actually might be awesome. We should start that. But anyway, the passcode would be, he is risen, he is risen indeed. It's like the only thing we have going for us. So anyways, really, really good to see you, everybody. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're a guest, a visitor with us, we're so glad to have you celebrating Jesus' resurrection today. And we know that we've, we've missed you, like Mark said, uh, last couple of years. Last year, he alluded to it. We did eight gatherings outside, one in here on the live stream, eight outside the year before, all kinds of like specials and different things and like a lot of just empty rooms. And so it's really a gift uh, to be together, to sing to each other, now to unpack the word. We have a lot to celebrate. Uh, We have just come through uh, as a church, 40 days, it's called, it's the season of Lent, 40 days of of fasting in the preparation for Easter. And I really want you to grab this. Like if we understand what it is that we're celebrating today, uh, what we're doing now is now we begin 40 days of feasting. It's really important. Like fasting, like the feasting and celebration is just as important a spiritual discipline as fasting. So if you want to, like if you want to just prep yourself for 40 days of feasting, go for it. Have fun with it. Like we we have a lot to celebrate today. Christians all over the world celebrate the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. That's worth a round of applause, I think. And the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus is not some side element to the Christian faith. It's not like something we, we, you know, it's not like a bonus. It's not bonus points for us as Christians. Like without the resurrection, there is literally no gospel. There's no good news at all. Without the resurrection, uh, there's no saving from sin. Without resurrection, every word we preach is completely in vain. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, then anyone who identifies as a Christian should be pitied more than anybody else in the entire world because their life and their faith is a complete waste. If there's no resurrection, let's eat and drink for tomorrow, we die. And all of that is right out of the chapter we've been studying together over the last while as a church, 1 Corinthians 15. But because Jesus was raised, we have something to celebrate. Because Jesus was raised, we understand that there's a power in this world greater than death. Because Jesus was raised, we don't have to live as slaves anymore because we are going to be set free if you're in Jesus, just like Jesus was. Raised, just like Jesus was. Again, it's the point of everything we've been walking through uh, walking through in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians is a letter, if you haven't been around, written by the Apostle Paul to a, a, a group of Jesus people in an ancient Greco-Roman city named Corinth. And he's been out unpacking resurrection for them. 
In chapter 15, he's been showing them that Jesus' resurrection is just the beginning because when Jesus returns, which is where our hope is Christian lies, where Jesus returns, when that day comes, everyone trusting him as Lord, God, and King will be raised just like he was. But the text Catherine read for us this morning, the text that we're looking at today, actually begins with a real, a very real problem. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 50 with me. I'll have it on the screen for us today. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our first verse of of today's text is a problem for anybody made of flesh and blood. If you're made of flesh and blood, this verse says you have a problem because apparently there's no way to inherit the fullness of God's kingdom as we are today. Like as we currently exist, we cannot step into the fullness of life he asks for us. The kingdom here, the kingdom of God is shorthand for life in God's presence. Life with, with Satan, sin, death, and all their effects removed forever. Life in God's kingdom. And Paul says that this life, The life that we all crave. It's impossible to inherit this life without undergoing a massive transformation in our physical bodies. I'm not talking about a spiritual transformation. A physical transformation. He says it's impossible to step into the kingdom of God. Impossible to inherit that life without undergoing a massive physical transformation. What transformation? We just read it from perishable to imperishable. We looked at this language last week of perishable and imperishable, what it means. This is not just talking about like temporary versus eternal. This is talking about the process of decay being replaced by its opposite. Perishable to imperishable. This transformation that we need to experience in our physical bodies to inherit life in God's kingdom is a problem because none of us have the power to do that. None of us have the power to do that. This is way outside of our abilities. We don't have the power. We don't have the tech. We don't have the resources to pull off a transformation like that. The moment described here, this movement, this transformation from perishable to imperishable is the same as as is described for us in verse 23 of the same chapter. It's the moment that Jesus returns. And what we're seeing here, what the Holy Spirit wants to understand is that Jesus' resurrection was just the beginning Jesus told us his resurrection, his return, excuse me, would be like lightning flashing from the east to the west. It would be public, visible, this language of trumpets being blown. Like don't get caught up on what that's going to sound like. It's going to be loud, public, a global event when Jesus returns. There will be nothing secret about it. Loud, bright, public. Here's how it's laid out in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. We read, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. In this moment, church, and all of the sudden, at a time we're not expecting, the sky will break, Jesus will appear, and glorified bodies will replace the ones that we are currently stuck in, the ones so susceptible so early on to the process of decay. We're seeing like the signs that Jesus laid out and told us, watch for these signs. Like these things will precede my coming. We're seeing all kinds of those signs today in increasing measure all of the time. In Jesus' resurrection, what we celebrate at Easter tells us that God's plan is not just to set us free spiritually. He's not trying to give you just a new ideology. He's not trying to give you something new to think about. His plan is to set us free physically. He has a plan for our bodies. And I mean, that, like, having a plan for our bodies, that is absolutely amazing news. Our text opens with God requiring something of us that we can't do for ourselves. And I just want to, I want to pause there for a second and, and take that in a little bit more with you. You know, God actually requires things of us that we can't do for ourselves a lot in the Bible. 
He, he does this a lot. This happens kind of repeatedly. In, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a pattern in the Bible. If you haven't read the Bible a lot before, it happens a lot. He calls us to all kinds of things that are way beyond our abilities. I mean, he calls us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He calls us to holiness. He calls us out of darkness into light, even though we're slaves of sin. He calls us to love each other like we love ourselves. And none, none of us has what it takes to pull off that with, with, with on our own without him. And I'm pointing that out because we have to understand that one of the main reasons we celebrate Jesus' resurrection is because through resurrection, God has done and will do all kinds of things we could never do for ourselves, including this transformation from perishable to imperishable. In relationship with the creator, all we ever are is beneficiaries. And there's nothing, there's nothing we bring that he needs. In fact, in Psalm 50 verse 12, the creator of the universe says, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world and its fullness are mine. Like way too many people think that God wants or needs something from them. There is nothing you can give him that isn't already his. There is nothing, the, nothing at all that we can give him that doesn't already belong to him. The good news of the gospel is that he needs nothing and that we are the needy ones. And what we celebrate today is that he wants to give us what we need. In fact, he wants to give us everything. Church, we celebrate resurrection not just because it makes salvation work on paper. We celebrate resurrection because of what God has done, is doing, and will do for us through it. This text is the crescendo of chapter 15. And in it, we're going to see three things God does for us in resurrection. Here's the, here they are. We've already kind of started looking at the first one. He is going to transform our body, remove the sting of death, and he invites us to partner. So through resurrection, he transforms our bodies, removes the sting of death, and invites us to partner with him. Let's go back to the transformation of our bodies uh, and, and look at this together. So drop down to verses, uh, verse 51 and listen to what Paul writes. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Again, this is the moment of Jesus' returns. We read about it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. In this moment, all of a sudden, the sky will break and Jesus will appear and he, we will be changed. He will change us, not just spiritually, but physically. And this is so important because so many of us are working so hard to try and reverse the process of decay right now. Like it doesn't matter how well you track your macros. It doesn't matter how long you stay in ketosis. It doesn't matter like how much animal or, or plant protein you digest, you ingest into your body. Your body will fail you. It doesn't matter how much you can deadlift. Your body will give up on you. Decay will set in. I was reminded of this yesterday. I was going to the gym, and when I go to the gym, like everything about me is so alpha. Like, it's incredible. It's mostly the gangster rap I'm listening to as I go to the gym. And so I'm heading there. I'm walking down Robson, and I'm just in that, I'm in that place. I'm getting ready to walk into this building. Like, I don't look at anybody. Everybody on the sidewalk's afraid of me when this is happening. That's, that's how I feel. And, and so I'm, I'm in this moment, and it's a big moment for me. And, and I'm, I'm walking to the gym, and then I have to sneeze. And I'm nervous about it because it's, we've just come through a pandemic. And so I'm like, I'm, there's people. And so I like, I turn to the side and I sneeze and like, I throw my whole neck out <laughs> and, my, and my shoulder. And so I'm like, I'm, I start limping now. Like now I have like, cause I sneezed. And so my whole body, like I'm, and so I, I feel like, Lord, I need so much more than a gym. Like I really, we really need this, but we want to so badly reverse the process of decay that we're experiencing. We're trying so hard to fight it, but in the end, that inherent desire to beat decay is just one you can't fulfill. You can't beat the decay you are experiencing. I mean, unless you're like 11 or 12 or 13 years old, you don't know what I'm talking about. Everybody else, you can't beat it. And that's again why we celebrate resurrection because it means that if you belong to Jesus, the power of God is getting ready to go to work in your body. Jesus' resurrection means God has an actual plan for your physicality. Resurrection means 
He cares about the things that you care about. You know how you care what you eat? You care about what you make for food because you're trying to take care of yourself. You care about what your kids eat. You care about your, your, how your family takes care of their bodies, whether or not your parents are exercising. You care about those things. God cares about those things too. And he has a plan for your body. Like when you look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror and all you see is decay, remember that resurrection says God has a plan not just to transform you spiritually, but to transform us physically too. New bodies, glorified bodies so that we can inherit life in his kingdom, life in his presence. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when Jesus returns, we will be changed from perishable to imperishable. I love how N.T. Wright puts it. He says, the message of the resurrection is that the problems and pains of this present world matter. This is not about escape. This is not about some pie-in-the-sky idea that just takes us away from the problems and the pain of the present world. No, this is, allows us to enter into it, to fully embrace it, not to hide from it and pretend that we can beat these things that we can't beat. Sometimes, sometimes people who don't know Jesus think that Christians live in this fairy tale world where we're just like imagining things that we want to imagine to make ourselves feel better, but I really think it's the other way around. We have a place for brokenness. We have a place for tragedy. We have a place for the sting of death. We have a place for decay. We understand where, where they come from, where they're going, but everybody else living like they don't exist or trying to beat them through plastic surgery or what, putting stuff in all kinds of weird places in their bodies or going to the gym like eight times a week. It's who's really hiding? Jesus has a plan for our physical bodies. Our hope is in him. If this is not good news, I, I don't know what is. God is not apathetic about the stuff you care about. And we know that because Jesus was raised. In resurrection power, God will transform our bodies and he will remove the sting of death. Listen to what the Spirit says in verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass. Then shall come to pass. Church, only then shall come to pass. The saying is written, the saying that we sung this morning, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. Now, this is a quote from the Old Testament, like the first kind of two-thirds of your Bible, where the prophet Isaiah uh, is full of the Spirit and, and prophesies this, and it's so beautiful. The Spirit gives Isaiah this image of death being swallowed up. He says it's like a veil right now, covering all the nations on earth. Like every people group, every language, they're covered by this veil called death. And, and he pictures the death, the moment death is swallowed up as a feast. He says it'll be a feast of the very best food, rich food full of marrow. Like when you eat bone marrow at a restaurant, that maybe gross you out, but I love it. And so when you eat, it's like the feast of rich food. And he says, and the very best wine, vats and vats and vats of the best aged wine. He says there will be perfect healing in that moment from every drop of death that we ever tasted. That's where we're going. But for now, death still stings, doesn't it? Like we sang that song this morning, oh death, where's your victory? Oh death, where's your sting? And if you're paying attention, you should be looking around going, it's right freaking here. It's right here. It's in the decay. It's in the loved ones that we've lost. Like we know the sting of death. And I know it's, it's not really a popular subject, but unless Jesus comes back first, every one of us will taste it ourselves. Not just sitting by the bedside, we'll taste it ourselves. Unless Jesus comes back first, your last battle will be one that you lose. The last battle you fight, you will lose. And I mean, we hear about death happening all, uh, unexpectedly all of the time, don't we? I mean, Bob Saget, Danny Tanner, bumps his head, goes to sleep and never wakes up. Like a few weeks ago, Taylor Hawkins goes on tour with the Foo Fighters, never comes home. Then throw in like every car accident that you pass by, heart attacks that happen suddenly. A friend of mine, just a couple years ago, his mom starts a load of laundry. She trips and she's gone. 
Death happens, unex- like the least surprising thing about our lives is that death comes unexpectedly. We know this, right? It's happening all of the time, being reported all of the time. The total unexpectedness of our own impending deaths is the least surprising thing about life. And regardless of what we say, we believe, I know some Christians who still live with very real fear because of it. Fear of experiencing the pain and the trauma of death. I mean, however you look at it, going through death is going to be such a foreign experience. And the verses we just read acknowledge that there is pain. There is trauma associated with death. That's the sting Paul's talking about. Sting here gives us the picture of being bitten like by a venomous animal, a venomous snake. It's the sting of being bitten and poisoned. And what we just read is that if we encounter our own death still in the context of sin and breaking God's law, that bite that we experience, that we will all experience unless Jesus returns first, that bite will be fatal. But Jesus' resurrection means it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. No, in resurrection, Jesus proved his immunity to death and offers anyone who wants it an antidote to drink before you experience it for yourself. Those in Jesus might still feel the sting of death, but if you've drank, drunk, drank, I don't know, if you've ingested (laughs) the antidote, the bite will not be fatal. Resurrection means that waiting on the other side, like if you experience death and the bite is not fatal, Resurrection means that waiting on the other side of that final battle that you will lose, that I will lose, is Jesus himself. You get bit by this thing called death. If you have the antidote to the poison, the next thing you see is Jesus. That's what the resurrection means. Now that... That's only good news if you know Jesus. Otherwise, it's just information. It changes nothing. You might profess to be a Christian, but if that is just information to you, if that doesn't do something to you, to think, okay, one last battle, and then Jesus. Like, if that doesn't fill you with hope, church, excitement, you might not know him. You might not know, so, but, for, but if you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, what this does for you is it removes your fear of death. There is a sting. There is a bite. It's okay to not want it. It's okay to be nervous about it, but there is a hope on the other side of it. Resurrection means there's a hope on the other side of it that can overwhelm our fear of death. To live in resurrection power means we live without the fear of death as ultimate power. The rest of the world, family, church, the rest of the world lives with death. The reason we don't want to talk about it, the reason it's uncomfortable to think about, the reason we put it off as long as we can, the reason we fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it, because we, there's nothing beyond it for us. Jesus' resurrection, the reason it so changed the world, the reason it so changed the disciples, the reason why it so changed Paul and, you know, hundreds of millions throughout history who have encountered the risen, living Jesus is because it takes away the thing that otherwise we live our lives slaves to, the sting of death. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 57. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you die as a Christian, if you die in Jesus, if you die having, I still don't know how to say it, ingested the antidote. I've been thinking this whole time, is it drank, is it drunk? I have no idea. If you die having ingested the antidote, then all that is for you is sleep. You will go to be with Jesus in spirit and you will wake up with the rest of the church when Jesus returns, transforms our bodies, swallows death once and for all, and we start drinking wine. He is going to break his fast with us. Jesus, do you know that? Jesus right now is on a fast. It's lasted a while. He said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until we do it together in the kingdom. When he breaks his fast, I think he's going to get a little bit under control personally. 
I think that's going to be a fun moment for all of us. And if you die in Jesus, you go to be with him in spirit and you get woken up for the party. That's what resurrection means. We celebrate Jesus' resurrection because it guarantees his final victory over death. Let me give you one last reason we celebrate resurrection. Because through it, God transforms our bodies, removes the sting of death, and he invites us to partner with him. Look at verse 58 with me. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So because Jesus, like at the beginning I talked about, like if he was not raised, there's no gospel, there's no good news at all. If he was not raised, then all of this preaching is in vain. If he was not raised, then Christians are the most to be pitied of all people anywhere in the world. If he was not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Like we've seen all of that. But because Jesus was raised, the inverse of all those things is also true. Because Jesus was raised, there is good news for the world. Because Jesus was, was raised, there is a gospel to be preached. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is right now moving in Jesus' people as a perfect expression of the Father's desire to set captives free. The spirit right now, the spirit of Jesus is moving in Jesus' people as a perfect expression of the Father's heart to set captives free from Satan, sin, and from death. So that death may have a sting, but the bite is not fatal. And the invitation for every Christian, the invitation for anyone who, man, oh man, i got to figure this out eventually. The first thing I'm going to do when I go home is, is look this up on Google. For anybody who ingests the antidote, the first, man, oh man, the invitation of this moment, what is it? Drinking. Drinking is not right. No, no, no. That's not. <laughs> See, that's why we don't ask for audience help when we do this. <laughs> for anybody who takes the antidote, the invitation is to partner with him. It's to partner with him. Church, the Christian life is a life partnering with him. The reason the Spirit fills us with the Father's heart is because he wants to set captives free through you. Please don't miss this. He wants to set captives free through you. Your life, if you are in Jesus, your life, you may not have the fear of death anymore, good, but your life has a purpose. Your life has meaning. You are here to be used by him to set captives free. It's another thing you can't do without him. But he wants to fill you for this purpose. This is literally why you are here. For anybody who surrenders to the promptings of the Spirit, it is a wild ride. And there are three words in verse 58 that describe the kind of partnership he wants with us. Have a look at at it with me again. There are three words I want to look at. Jesus wants to make you steadfast. Steadfast. it It means he wants to give you a purpose that's so big, so much bigger than, than your daily experience and, and, and the circumstances around you that you can actually stand on and live for something that goes way beyond a few decades of decay. This is something really hard to find in this life. It's really hard to be steadfast in this world when everything is shaking, when the markets are shaking, when death, when the sting of death is like all over the place and that snake is just biting. When decay seems like a runaway train that can't be stopped, it's really hard to live steadfast. But living in the power of the resurrection for anybody who does means you live full of the Spirit and the Spirit makes you steadfast. He also wants to make you immovable. Not just giving you something to stand on from a positive sense, but giving you a force that, 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 that makes you completely immovable from anything that would come at you in a negative sense. This means there's nothing that can come at you and knock you off the place you are standing. You are an immovable object full of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be pushed to the left or to the right. No matter what obstacles are thrown at you or circumstances come your way, he wants to make you steadfast. Church, he wants to make you immovable in this mission to set captives free. And then he wants to cause you to abound. Steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding. This word abound, abounding, it, it, it speaks of an overflow. The way Jesus said that his spirit would interact with us, he said the, the Holy Spirit in you will become like rivers of living water. Can you imagine? Like picture a river and then picture a river inside of your physical body. A rushing river inside of your physical body. This church, this is supposed to be the Christian life. Steadfast, immovable, abounding. Abounding in what? Abounding in his work. Always abounding in his work. Not your work. His work. Sometimes I abound with my work, with my ideas, with my pursuits, with my ambitions, with my loves, with my desires, with my fears. I abound with these things and they drive me. And from the moment I wake up in the morning to the moment I, I put my head back on the pillow at night, I've been abounding all day with my work. The Holy Spirit, because Jesus was raised, has something so much better for each one of us. He wants you to abound with his work. He wants you to partner with the creator of the universe, the sovereign of the universe, the one who doesn't need you. Who if he were hungry, he wouldn't tell you. For the world is already his. You are being invited to partner with the one who owns all things. I don't know. Like I, I don't know if you've ever like met somebody, had the chance to meet somebody who's like, I don't know, like really important to you, like a hero of yours. I don't know if it's like for you, if it would be like a celebrity or a politician or an author or a, a, a scientist or, or or philosopher or whatever. But when you step into the company, like if you've ever had this experience, I've had it a few times, and like if you ever step into the the like the the presence. The, the, the personal space of somebody that you really look up to, somebody you really admire, somebody who is greater than you, the way that you measure greatness, you just feel privileged to be there, don't you? And you're careful with what you say. Like you're, you're careful with what you bring up. And, and, and imagine this person who's like, who's like so much greater than you in your estimation that you look up to so much. Imagine they invite you into their life. Like not, not just invite out for a meal. Like invite out to a meal is an amazing thing. Being invited to dinner by someone like that, amazing. But imagine they invite you to partner with them in what they're doing. This is the Christian life. We are invited by the greatest of all, the most famous of all, the wealthiest of all, the greatest creative that has ever existed, the greatest philosophical mind that there could ever be, the most holy, the most awesome, the most awe-inspiring being is inviting you. I, I, I would suggest this. If this is boring to you, you do not see him yet. You do not know him yet this call to be steadfast immovable and always abounding in his work means he wants to do all of this for you because he wants nothing you do in your life to be done in vain meaninglessness purposelessness it's, if there's a pandemic right now it's a pandemic of meaninglessness and I heard uh, Elon Musk talking about like not that long ago, just you talking about as we move further and further down the road of AI, the real human problem is going to be meaninglessness. How do we help the people who nobody needs to feel important? It's a problem that God solves for us in resurrection. He wants what you do in this life to matter way beyond it. His desire is to fill you with purpose and meaning. And this partnership is incredible. I mean, we come to him with nothing but need. He gives us everything. And then in the end, he rewards us. He rewards us for whatever we did with what he gave. Do you see your part? Your part is just to be a beneficiary. Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection wrote a contract. 
a contract that he signed with his blood. It's, it's an inheritance contract. To come to Jesus and bow to him as Lord, God, and King, to come to him and say, I'm needy, you're alive, which means you are not. And to bow before him as Lord, God, and King, to say, make me steadfast, immovable, and f- make me abound with your work. It's to have your name added written in the blood of Jesus on that. You become an heir to the very throne of God. Jesus, as we wrap this up, doesn't need anything from you. He doesn't desire to sell you anything. Even if you're a Christian, like man, sometimes even people who identify as Christians are so skeptical of this. Like Jesus was the world's worst salesman. He really was. He's terrible at it. He sent way more people away than he ever kept with him. And once a crowd started to form, he would just offend them and they would all leave. And one time as as, as these crowds were leaving Jesus and he looked at his disciples, the the core, and said, do you want to leave too? And they said, how can we leave? You alone have the words of life. They could be steadfast, immovable, eventually after the resurrection, always abounding because Jesus alone has the words of, words of life. Jesus has something he wants to give you. That's the point. Three things. Because he was raised, he wants to transform your body. He wants to remove the sting of death. And he wants to invite you to partner with him. This is the invitation of Easter. It's the invitation of the resurrection. And it's really easy to step into that life. We do it simply by celebrating resurrection. Doesn't matter if you already know him or you're just starting to get to know him right now. He wants to meet you, to give you these things as your inheritance if you come to him as a living Lord, God, and King. We do that in celebration. In celebration, we turn to him. In celebration of his resurrection, we confess the reality that we are needy and he is all-powerful. As we celebrate resurrection, we repent of our sin. We turn from it. As we celebrate resurrection, we we reject self-worship. We are not the smartest ones in the room. We, We reject this idea that we can beat DK on our own and we ask him to do it for us. And that's exactly what we're gonna do right now through the waters of baptism. Man, it's been like such a gift over the last, like it, in the pandemic season, we baptized 78 people. This, the, yeah. The Spirit of God in the midst of a pandemic. That's just one local church. There's a lot of great churches in Vancouver. I was texting with some pastors uh, last, last night and, and in, the, in, the, in this last week especially. We always tend to do that a lot in the lead up to Easter. But we spend lots of time together. Like, it's just one church. Like 78 people here, but a lot of, in a lot of other churches too, like the Spirit of God has not been slowing down on the pandemic. This has not been a distraction for him or an obstacle that he can't overcome. In fact, it's been the opposite. But what baptism is, is very important for you to understand. Like th- what, what these individuals who are stepping into the water today, there's three of them today, and what they're stepping into the water today and saying it is not primarily, this is not primarily, primarily their profession of faith. It is that, but it's not primarily that. What this is primarily is God's gift to them. It's not them doing something for God. It's God giving a gift to them. Just he wants to give gifts to all of us, us, the gifts of Jesus' resurrection. It's a sign. It's a symbol. It's, It's in some ways a seal of the life that God has for them. When these people are put under the water, It's a symbol of the sting of death. Dying with Christ. It's it's saying, I am joined to Jesus in his crucifixion. I'm joined to Jesus in his death. Being brought up out of it is saying, I've been given the antidote because of Jesus' immunity. It's a symbol of resurrection and the resurrection life. This is not something, again, they do for God. It's God giving them a physical symbol. He loves to give us physical symbols because he cares about us physically, about your body physically. 
He understands why you go to the gym and eat terrible, terrible tasting things. He cares about your physical needs. So after these individuals, after we celebrate their baptisms, we just will stand and we'll celebrate with them. As we do that, we're going to go into time of communion. God wants to give you another gift this morning, another physical symbol of his life, his death, and his resurrection in this little cup with a tiny wafer on the top and a little bit of juice in the bottom. And this, this bread and this wine, this cracker, this juice, these are symbols. Jesus asked us, told us, commanded us, invited us to proclaim his death until we see him again in this way. So this is only for you if you, I would identify as a Christian, Jesus being your Lord, God, and King. If you say, I'm somebody who celebrates resurrection. I've encountered the living God. He is my hope. He's the one who makes me steadfast and movable, and I want to abound with his work. I want to partner with him. Then come forward, take one of those cups and go back to your seat and just enjoy that time with Jesus. When you taste the crack, remember his body broken. When you taste the juice, remember his blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. It's also the blood with which he signed the contract, your inheritance, and celebrate with us. We're going to have some people down here at the front for prayer. If you need prayer for anything, this is not about an exchange of ideas. These are not people who want to counsel you right now. These are people that are up here, and they're already praying for you whether you come forward or not. They might come up to you in the aisles if they have a word for you or a picture for you or something like that. Otherwise, come to them. If you're, to, if you're struggling, if you're in need, if you want to come to Jesus, if you need to be filled with hope, if the sting of death and decay is too much, whatever you need, come be ministered to. There is a transfer of spiritual power in prayer. That's why we do it. And man, oh man, the Holy Spirit has been at work through prayer in the last while. So please come forward and be prayed for. So glad you're here. Like so incredibly thankful that you're here. If you are sensing anything, if any of this is speaking to your heart, it is like a 100% guaranteed, not me. If, if there is anything speaking to you, it's because the Holy Spirit is doing a work right now. Do not resist him. Do not harden your heart. Holy Spirit, would you come and fall on these people? Would you come and fill? Will you come and convict? Convict us of sin. Lord, convict us of our neediness. Show us how completely needy we are. I pray for those who are wealthy in the same vein as those who are very poor. And I pray that all of us together, healthy and sick, joyful, happy, or mourning, Lord, in this moment, transcend all of that, bypass all of that Holy Spirit, and just let us see Jesus. Let us encounter the risen Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And as we celebrate, Lord, would you please do work that only you can do. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We are just so incredibly blessed, thankful to be your children, your beneficiaries. In Jesus' name, amen.